Welcome to this discussion on Black British Champions in Cycling. I'm Dr. Marla Moncrief, former racing cyclist, former teacher, now practicing as an academic researcher specializing on Black British lives and experiences, and particularly in the sport of cycling. So, yeah. In 2016, I conceived original research, study, and report entitled Uncovering the Life Histories of Black British Champions in Cycling seeking to share and understand how they were made in Britain. This was original research with a focus on the marginalised discussions of diversity, inclusion and, represent and representation in the sport of cycling mm -hmm. from the narrative lens of a black British power. This research toured the UK as an exhibition of photography, artwork and the sharing of narratives and oral testimonies from black champion cyclists produced by Britain over the last 50 years for public engagement and education, and it received wide respect and acclaim. Two of the British champion cyclists involved in my research, study and report join me today. Welcome, Morris Burton and Charlotte Cole Hussein. Morris. Yes, good evening. Um, my name is Morris Burton. I was three times British champion, 73, 1974, 1975. Um, I, I moved on from that and went over to the continent to Belgium when I was 19 years old and, um, and went forward to have a career as a professional cyclist on the continent riding with the best riders at the time. Um, unfortunately, I had a crash in 1984, broke my leg and stopped um, competitive cycling at that point, although I still continue to ride and I now have my business, which I run, which I've had 33 years, bicycle shop, and I help um, the local community and um, up and coming riders. Brilliant. Charlotte, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Charlotte Collison. I raced in uh, mostly as a youth and a junior rider. Um, in that time, I won one national uh, British championship as a youth rider and one national championship as a junior rider, one on the road and one on the track. Um, and then uh, after that, I sort of stopped cycling uh, competitively um, for a while. And I'm now mostly involved in um, in in other capacities. So I do coaching and um event organising and volunteering in any way possible, uh, mostly based at Hernhill Velodrome, which is where I, I uh, started my cycling career as well. Brilliant. Now, uh, in effect, what, what we have here then, in effect, we uh, have the first black British male track cycling champion, um, and we also have the first black British female track cycling champion in Charlotte Cocker State and in Morris Burton. So this is, this is quite historic. Uh, discussion really um there's no there's been nobody before you with um a black heritage to have a have won a, a national championship so very pleased to be um in discussion with you this evening um yeah i guess what we want to do this evening is to provide an opportunity for listeners for viewers to, to share on some of your experiences in the sport not necessarily to give you full life history per se but more an understanding of some of your successes and some of your challenges um in the sport you're becoming champions the role that mentoring played in that, and, and how you give back in that respect as as, as, as being mentors now and, and servants to the cycling community. Um, you know, you know what, what what kind of role do you think um, um, that can assist with um, with access and in, and inclusivity in the sport for um, for black people, for Asian people, for people who are minority ethnic groups in the country. This is this is what we want to kind of discuss this evening. So. Let me begin with a, a question about um, about becoming a cycling champion. I mean, maybe I can start with Morris. Morris, can you just give us a brief understanding about you know how you became a a British cycling champion? Who who do you think were um, the mentors or the people around you that assisted you in taking that first British title? Uh, well, the first assistance I got was. Um, after after I went with the school to Hearn Hill Velodrome and the coach at the time whose name was Bill Dodds. Bill Dodds um, um, assisted me 
although I, I was fully aware from the beginning that I did have the ability and it right. was for a fact what I needed was somebody to, that could point me in the right direction. So yeah. I, I had no information that's available now via all kind of social media and so forth wasn't around at that, at that time. Yeah. So, um, and so if you didn't have anybody who could point you in the right direction, for example, I wouldn't even know how to enter a race or, or, or anything. So it all started for me with, um, with going to Hern Hill Village Run, you see. Um, um, and then from there, it was a matter of fact that um, that um, along along the way there was there was people who, who assisted me along the way, um, like for example um, John Nicholson, who was Australian, who was world sprint champion. This man, sure. this man, among other things, taught me how to drive. You see, yeah, <laughs> things that um, uh, and there was um, in Belgium when I went to Belgium there was there was Australians who who had coached. Um, somewhere like in the region of 40 world champions and Olympic champions, not just from Belgium, but but he, he was a person that that um, these were people, all of these were people that um, irrespective, I, fe I feel personally, these were people that irrespective of your colour, they, they, they were, they, 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 because you had the talent, they, they recognised that talent and were prepared to help you. Yes, yeah, good point, Maurice. Yes, yeah, so you, what, what you're saying is that because you had the hunger and the desire and the attitude and um, the confidence in terms of what you wanted to do and what, and what you wanted want to be, you, you felt that people were attracted to that and they could see that in you. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's really good that you found some people who could see that in you and they supported you on the way. What about you, Charlotte? I mean, um, can, can you talk about some of the mentors with the people around you that supported your journey to becoming a, a British champion cyclist? Uh, yeah, well, I was actually really lucky in that my dad was a competitive cyclist. So he was the main uh, force for me and the main the main thing that, that helped me, all those things that Morris talks about, not knowing how to enter races and not knowing how to buy, what size wheel you need, what size sprocket you need, etc. Uh, my dad was already had all that knowledge from his uh, from his racing and his riding before. So uh, he took me down to Herne Hill when I was quite young, about eight years old, with my uh, with my brother and sister. Yeah. And he wanted to basically wanted to introduce his kids to this this life that he had that he had loved when he was younger. He raced at Herne Hill as well, and sort of was still doing it at the time when he took us. Um, and throughout my whole cycling career and throughout as I as I grew older and started doing more serious things and started needing more assistance in in terms of uh, I want to do this race in Belgium I, I need a way to get there I want to do this race over here or uh, my dad was the main the main one for me helping me out and mentoring me and kind of providing uh, what I needed in terms of advice but um, I can't really no, I think very little of it would have happened without all of the, all the guys at Herne Hill and BCL especially as well, because um, all all the people there will have done some something either in a small way or a big way that went towards uh, not just me but every rider who's gone through that that similar system at Herne Hill. Um, all of the coaches and and people helping out there, volunteers. Uh, so it's kind of a big in that in that way it works as a kind of a big ecosystem. Uh, yeah. of, of of lots of lots of different pieces that work together to 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 help and support people because not everyone will be as lucky as me and have parents who are already in the sport or parents who are who are interested in the sport. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's it's brilliant that yeah I think you've you've, you've hit the nail on the head there in terms of the, the sort of cultural capital that you um and that that you had for your father who was in, in involved in cycling and also both of you um, from South London with um, the famous Herne Hill Velodrome on your doorsteps, having that out of convenience, that, that gives you the opportunity to nurture your talent. Also, the fact that you that there's racing at Crystal Palace as well, which I know that both of you have taken part in on, on Tuesday evenings, those, those particular spaces have given you the opportunity to sort of develop um, your strengths and cycling as well. So, yeah, I mean, credit, I mean, 
is that correct when, when I say that the fact that you have that, that you had those spaces that that helped as well Morris sorry spaces as in what 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 spaces you talking sorry like, Crystal Palace and Hearn Hill because you because they were quite convenient for you. Was, was, yeah I mean this is I guess so um Marlon because it, it, in the beginning um when I first started racing I only I only have a race at Hearn Hill and Crystal Palace. I think I may have, may, may have ventured over to Paddington Velodrome on the other occasion. But you see, um, I didn't, outside of Bill Dodds, I didn't have anyone really that, that was going to, I mean, my parents, especially my father, didn't, in, not only um, didn't, um, didn't understand what I was doing riding a bike, but they didn't really want me to ride a bike, full stop. Yeah. So it was, and, 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 and the only other one that used to ride with me, another young black rider called Joe Clovis, his parents were exactly the same. So we, we, um, we didn't have any means of transport to get us to races and things. So Hernhill and Crystal Palace was, was how it worked for me. I mean, for example, even even the tires because the tires in those days were tubular tires they had to be glued on the rims um i used to have to to glue the tires on the track wheel to ride at Hearn Hill on monday and then take the same tires off and glue them onto road wheels to ride at crystal palace on tuesday that's wow. how it used to be <laughs> and, and then again i was lucky and i won a tub i remember the first the second race i rode at crystal palace i won a tub that day so these little things helped me along the way. <laughs> okay, I mean, let's let's talk about some of the let's let's start with Charlotte with this one. Let's talk about some of the uh, challenges and, and, and barriers that you faced um, in your in your careers. So and, and and how you may aim to sort of overcome them. So I guess um you know you know in terms of um let's let's, let's focus on national events really. Um, can you think of any sort of um um, significant event or race, um, Charlotte or Morris, Charlotte, first of all, where um, you go to plan as as they could have done, you know, but there were big learning points for you in terms of making you a stronger cyclist and a stronger person. Can you think of any event um, that enabled you that personal growth? Yeah, uh, well, one uh, one of the um, events I competed in as an under-14 was the National Omnium Final. It was a uh, national event you had to qualify to get there so you ride a couple of rounds of regional omniums and then uh, i think the top five riders qualify for the national event so you've got the kind of best riders in the country on the track um and i the first race up was the time trial which was my worst event at the time and um i uh I, I went out and did a what I thought was a, was a fairly good time, a fairly good result. I came in fourth, which was a lot higher, a lot better than I was expecting. Yeah. Um, but what happened is the uh, the the timers had had missed one of the riders and hadn't managed to time one of the riders, um, who who was a, a very competitive um, rider who I, we, everyone would expect would kind of come in the top three. Uh, yeah. And so the judges had to they decided to scrap that event entirely and. Um, her uh, her dad said to the judges at the time that I've got I timed her myself I've got a time for her but obviously you know they didn't want to they wouldn't want to come across as, as though they were cheating or anything dodgy going on so they had to scrap the event it's a hard position to be put in as well um, because you have no no real choice and I was quite upset because I thought this is quite a good starting point for me to have this this good first event considering this is my worst event um and then the the second event was the was the elimination race the devil which was not usually my best event so i was quite excited for that and then i was um i was pulled out early at least no. what I, I i thought was early um and i tend to know because i i always rode quite a um a i'd always had this, a similar tactic which was to kind of ride past people at the last minute and just catch out one rider every lap and i was fairly certain that lap i'd managed to, to stay in but it was kind of seventh or eighth that I was called out. And I was, at this point, I was quite angry and I, I kind of, uh, let my um, let my frustration get the better of me a, a little bit because they'd, they'd kind of taken away the first result, which I thought was quite good. And then this result, which I decided also was, was an incorrect one. So I went over to the judges and asked if I could see if the photo finished photo. Um, 
And then they had a second look at it and they said, we, we don't we don't show photo finished photos to other people. So um, I, I was I was quite upset at that. And I was fairly young, I was about 14 years old. Um, yeah. So I, I forgive myself a tiny bit, but I did I did certainly overreact. Um, and I sent uh, I sent a rather rude email to the organizer of the event um, in the in the in the thinking that um, there was a chance that she wouldn't open it then and there. She would um, yeah. open it the next day that, and I wouldn't. There would be no repercussions in terms of disqualification. Uh, yeah. But I was then um, I was called over to the commissaires, and I had to have a chat with them. And I was spoken to by a, a BC coach who was also a coach for our, our club. Uh, and it, it was it was it was that was for me kind of the the time when I decided I'm gonna try and not take this so seriously all the time I was never I never took it too seriously but yeah. you know every now and then when you think that you can get a good result you think yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna put I'm gonna you know get in the zone I'm gonna focus I'm gonna try, try and do quite well but yeah. uh, since then I thought you have to just know that it's just fun and it's just uh, a sport it's something I do on my weekends and after school right. um yeah. Because otherwise, what happens is that I just get too. Uh, I, I can let the my anger and aggression get the better of me. So that that point was when I realised this is meant to be fun. You should just let this be fun because I don't want to have any similar situations like this. I don't want to upset event organisers, and I don't want to. I don't want to be the the person with the bad attitude or or anything like that. So that was big big kind of growth moment for me. A big growth moment for you, but I see. I, I still sense in you that that. Um, that that's that that's you as a an athlete in terms of wearing your emotions on your sleeve and and um, there, there's still something strong and powerful in that for you as an athlete. So yeah, I, I can I can see how you've grown from that. But also, if that's you, it's hard to sort of you know it's hard to sort of um, move away from that. But yeah, it's it's good to manage it, I suppose. Morris, what about you? Can you think of any moments at track events where things have got out of hand and you've had to? I wouldn't say out of hand. I wouldn't say well. There's there's various events that things haven't gone exactly to plan. Uh, one of them that I recall after you know because I've had I've been fortunate to have Charlotte um, explain her situation first, so I had a little chance to to think about things a little bit. Um, well, there's a race you may have heard of called the White Hope Sprint. I do. Yeah. Y yes. So. Um, so I actually rode that event twice, you see. Um, yeah. The first time I rode that event would have been, um, my goodness, now I'm to think. 1973. Yes, 1973. Um, I was quite confident that I was going to win this event in yeah. 1973, you see. And, um, it was quite a windy day on that day, and so I thought I don't want too big a gear. Yeah. But um, I found I found coming down the home straight that I was pedaling like a madman, and and I, I I this is in the final, by the way. I made it through to the final. Okay. I, I lost I lost it by not too much, but you know maybe half a wheel, and um, yeah, I thought well, you know, there it is. Anyway, a few days later, a few days later, I was looking for this chain ring. You see, I thought, where's my um, where's my 48 tooth chain ring? Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't find it. Um, and actually, what am I saying? No, 46 tooth chain ring. Sorry, where's right. my 46 tooth chain ring? Because I thought I'd been riding with a 48 tooth chain ring. You see, but the teeth were so worn. I mean, not the teeth, the number on the chain ring was so worn. It wasn't yeah. actually 48 I was riding, it was 46. So where I thought I had a relatively low gear of 86 inch gear, which would have been 48.15. Actually, what I had was an 82 inch gear. All right. I had 46.15 and I managed to make the final. And you know, on an 82 inch gear. Wow. So, <laughs> but next, in the following year, I didn't make that mistake again. No. And no. I, I truly won the race, but I should have really won it the year before. Yeah. And the only other, the only other event, which is a different type of experience, was at Crystal Palace. Yeah. And it was a hundred kilometer race on a Sunday, and um, there was a certain official who was 
who was very much in charge of things at that time in the area. Yeah. And he, um, he was duly um, um, commended for his efforts with, a, uh, with an MBE, I'm not sure, a certain Mr. Wingrave. Well, now, the thing is, you see, I'd already raced in Belgium by this time, and um, I, I, I'd been in a Belgian amateur team. This would have been about 1975, I guess. And um, I had these shorts on, and it had Bergerman on the shorts. But in those days, um, the letters were, were um, they weren't the, the length of the short, they were across the short. And he was, he, he took quite, on the, on the start line, he came across to me and said to me, you won't be able to ride because you've got advertising on your shorts. And I looked at him and then I got the shorts and I turned the, the, the shorts over to make them a bit shorter and hide the advertising. And I said, is that okay, Eddie? And he didn't have much to say. So I got in the race, um, got in the break, along with a former professional rider whose name was John Cleary. This man had ridden the Tour de France. Yeah. And um, we were away in the break. It's a 100 kilometer race. I won. I won the sprint. I beat John and John congratulated me, put his arm on my shoulder and said, well done. A few minutes later, it was a different story because um, Mr. Wingrove decided that I didn't win it. I came second and John won it. And it was only 20 years later that John saw me at the pedal club and said, you know, the truth is, I know you did win that race. You see, but um, it was you know, it was a hard um so what, was your what was your reaction when he came over to you, Morris, and, 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 he, and he put you in second? I mean, did you just nod and walk off, or, you know, did you... I, just, there, I, I just looked at them. I think the people... I, I think there was people watching who were, who were more angry than me. You know, I just looked on it and put it down to experience and said, well, in front of Mr Wingrave, if I ever have to come across a come in a race where he's involved, I better make sure that I win it by a bit more than um than um, than a few inches. Yeah. It just, you know, it's just um yeah, I mean it was you know, for a nineteen to do that to a nineteen year old boy, but I, I it, it didn't surprise me owing to the fact that the year a few years before when I was mm. a small boy, Mr. Wingrave at the end of the race that I'd won came came to me and said you won't win any races next year so um it, it didn't surprise me yeah so, i mean i guess smiled. sorry i smiled marlon i yeah. smiled because i feel sorry for people like that yeah <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a fantastic um um sharing of your story there you know from you and from you charlotte as well and uh, i guess it kind of it, it begs the question about um you know, in terms of uh, being um, being sort of black in, 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 in a white dominated sport of cycling and, and, you know, that particular experience there, you know, was, you know, was that a regular occurrence for you, for you, Morris? You know, Charlotte, have you experienced any of these sort of situations where you felt that, um, I mean, Morris haven't said that it was because of your um, skin colour, but obviously someone took a dislike to you. But I mean, have you ever been made to feel that way charlotte that that your presence because of your um skin color is, is, has been an issue or not um i don't think the thing is i think what one thing that people have learned in the last at least sort of 50 years is to be a lot how to be a lot more covert uh with things like that no one would would come up to you and say oh you're not going to win races next year or that kind of thing nowadays i think because they just know that they wouldn't get away with it mm. and i think that because of that, a lot of the uh, why the word um, the, the word microaggressions is used so much now. I think because a lot of the uh, a lot of the experiences people like me and people who are growing up in my time and are in white dominated fields in my and kind of this my generation will experience almost solely microaggressions. There isn't as much overt uh, racism nowadays because people just know that they can't get away with it and. Because of that, it makes it a lot trickier to spot as well when you are being excluded or picked on or treated a certain way because of your race. It's a lot easier to say, this is this is a personal thing. This is because they don't like me or they don't like my personality or my attitude or I'm not talented enough. Um, 
So I, I would say I'm still extremely, extremely lucky to have competed in a different time when it was a lot less common. People are really not as as really not as racist um, as they have been in previous times, and the general culture isn't as uh, difficult to be non-white. Um, so I, I can't, I can't really, I'm lucky enough, can't really pick out anything uh, personal to me. Um, oh. Do you know that one I was racing in in the Netherlands once, and uh, I, I was I was quite often picked on by the the uh, especially the Dutch girls there didn't like me uh, doing well. Um, and once uh, one of the races I did about I think seven of them after the the race complained that I pulled their hair, which was, um, I never I've never done that. I I I think it's a, a really interesting way to try and beat someone. I would probably if I had to, I'd pull a different. I'd probably pull a saddle or something like that. But they yeah. obviously they conspired together to say we we want to get her disqualified. Um, and in that and that same event a couple of years later, a teammate of a teammate of mine who was uh, who's also mixed race, um, he was called the N word by a, a Dutch rider in the in the peloton. Obviously spoke to the judges and commissaires afterwards and had um, they had it sorted out, you know. But you'd expect or you'd hope I would at least that someone who does that in a uh, in a race would get disqualified from the race because it's it's racial abuse but i think that he yeah. got he got a, t- a telling off and he was allowed to start the next day and and mm. the boy in my club was also very forgiving of it because you just learn we just learn to to accept it and say this is how we're going to have to be if we want to continue doing what we what we want to do yeah it's not good enough there really ought to be some kind of um you know stronger discipline for that in this day and age as well um uh, of course morris you know wrote um, in a different generation, and, and you're right, it's more overt, but um, for Morris to have that resilience to um, just walk away from those situations um, is something to be respected completely, absolutely, but it shouldn't be tolerated in this day and age now because of you know, the, the, the space between your generations that, um, that, that, that people can be tar- targeted or um, you know, um, ganged up on because of the cut, the, the cut of their skin in, in, in the sport. It's just not, it's just not good enough. Um, so, I mean, I mean, how do you think um, from those sort of situations today um, in cycling, um, if um, if you're if you were young and if you were you're black or, or Asian and you, want, and you wanted to come into the sport, how could how could um, people like that be protected from um, situations like that that may be that may still fester in the cycling community? Um, Morris, have you got any ideas about how? young people want, want to come to the sport could maybe be protected from I think, uh, that young, I think young people coming into the sport now um it's you know it, it I'm, I'm not sure of the put it like this um the black community on a whole in my time anyway wouldn't um understand what a what a person, what a, what a teenager would want to be doing riding a bike, you know, yeah. what are you doing, you know, riding a bike? <laughs> and so, you know, the support that they would get as opposed to, um, they would need, what I'm saying is, I think, I think young black people would need um, support more than say white, the white um, riders, because the white riders would maybe Maybe they have their parents. Charlotte was lucky that her father was a cyclist, see, and he understood what was going on. A bit like, really, I guess, like Jermaine with me. Yeah. See, but um, but uh, you know, when you look at you look at their exceptions, Jermaine is an exception. How many? Um, there's a lot of talent out there, but the mm-hmm. thing is, is that if they haven't got people behind them to to back them. You know, you can't. You know, they can't. You can't just rely on their parents or or the situation. And the other thing is, of course, is the is the cost of material and the cost yeah. of equipment. Um, you know, which um, I mean, I I, I don't know. I, I just feel that I mean, where they have gear restriction, me um maybe maybe it's a little bit far fetched, but I think that they should they should have. You know that that riders of a stage in races should should only have they shouldn't have carbon wheels and all this sort of thing. They should have to ride on 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 more more sort of equipment. You know that that so that it makes it more affordable. So that you know 
on some. I mean, not that I not that I honestly believe that it always makes a huge difference as to what material you have, but yeah. psychologically, psychologically, it can affect. It can it can could affect some riders to see that they've got a bike that's a bit beat up, and other guys have got their brand new bikes with all their carbon stuff and all this on it, and they feel a bit intimidated. Yeah. You know? So um, there needs to be more equity um, for. Um, you need to find a more level playing field. Yeah, more, much more of a level playing field, and much more support for young um, black people coming into the sport in that respect. Equity and support. Charlotte, I mean, can you speak to that question in terms of, you know, based upon the previous answers to the experiences that, you know, that that that, that you and Morris face, you know, um, not saying that we, not saying that we can essentialize those experiences, but there's, you know, there's a possibility that people um, are out there in the sport that may still hold on to certain attitudes. How can we, how can we um, um, support young black people coming into the sport from those sorts of pieces, and how can we possibly even give education to um, those sorts of people that 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 that, that may be unfamiliar with um, black interest in the sport. Um, to to quickly um, speak to Morris's point, I completely agree, and I um, with the uh, with the restriction of equipment because I knew even that I think my dad kind of made a choice to, or both my parents made a choice to not splash out on the most expensive bike and the most expensive wheels and the most expensive everything when I was 10, 11 years old, and to buy two cyclocross bikes because you'll need to change them when you when they get muddy and to buy a mountain bike and to buy all of this in the knowledge that we all I, we could become uh stop being interested in the sport or we could um we'll very quickly grow out of all that equipment and it's true that when you go to those those races and you see people already with their fancy expensive wheels and bikes and all this equipment it's really alienate, alienating and if you're already someone who feels alienated because you're in a completely white space and maybe you're the only person from your club or you're the only person from your particular regional area it doesn't help at all and I do believe that um, in, in recent years British Cycling have changed the rules for the equipment that under 12s can use and they're not allowed they're now not allowed wheels that are under a certain that are um, thicker than a certain than a certain depth um, that I do I agree that should be extended to uh, potentially even group sets or carbon bikes and things like that because otherwise mm -hmm. it is a lot of pressure not only on the on the children but the parents and the mentors and supporters to be providing the, the highest end equipment um, but uh, aside from that to add to that the, uh, to the to kind of financial side of it there really should be um, in general more support for, um, for for individuals across the board especially those of of color who are going to be automatically going to be uh, alienated and be feel left out or uh, feel different uh, to most of the most of the riders in the sport and that comes through that grassroots level that comes through um, these really strong um, and involved clubs I think that people should be joining and we should have we should probably have I think maybe have fewer clubs the, the go ride clubs are a fantastic thing um fewer clubs for kids that are a really strong support network where you're more likely to meet um mm. other riders your age and you're more likely to be able to take yeah. advice from different coaches and things like that which is one thing that that we had uh, really well at vcl which is why you can see so many um a lot of actually a lot of the black and non-white riders will come will have come through VCL and come through the Herne Hill um, system. Obviously, there are kind of geographic and demographic uh, reasons for that as well. But I think part of it's because there's that support and there's that the the uh, the accountability. So I remember when my when my friend was was when a racial slur was hurled at my friend when we were racing in the Netherlands. What someone else from our club who wasn't his uh, parent went and spoke and kind of backed him up and and it's happened happened before when when uh, when you get when you get in trouble or you find yourself needing something needing help or something like that it really helps to have other people who are there to speak up and be your be support uh, have be the support for you um, yeah. it's yeah. not not just your parent. So yeah, it's it's about it's about having a support system um, in place that uh, young black people, young Asian people coming to the sport can feel protected by, um, and 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 also be supported um, by in terms of you know equity with with the equipment and the resources in that respect. 
Very good, very good. So, um, I just, I think... Um, I, I, I say something, sorry. Yes, um, regarding Netherlands and so forth with what um, Charlotte is saying, I, from my experience riding in those countries, um, I don't say that, that, that I was never, um, that was never a time when, when a rider um, said something derogatory to me, but generally speaking, um, I mean, now and again, they would, they would, they would refer to me as the Zwad, the Zwad, the black, you know, which, no, I mean, it was just, you know, a way of, of uh, I didn't take it to heart as such, you know, I just said the Zwad. <laughs> but um, generally speaking, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. They, I know, I don't think they ever called me um, the N word or anything like that. The only time I came across that was when I raced in Austria, and it was actually yeah, yeah. in a newspaper. It was saying about can the nigger beats um beat Sir Q in the sprint. Right. So, but generally, I think, I think um I think it was actually just a kind of a coincidence or like a, 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 a mathematical thing that this is the biggest event in terms of riders and numbers that my friend had ever ridden in so if you've got a pack of 100 or 150 riders however many there were it's kind of more likely that one of them will be racist towards you than when you ride in slightly smaller races i don't think that um i don't necessarily think that it's worse in in any other countries and in fact as um as marlon has pointed out uh, um before on the social medias and things france has got one of the best um the, the biggest diversity at the a high level there are lots of far more black athletes in the french um the french system and the french cycling the track team especially than there are in in the british one and any other country and yeah, yes i, I have put, oh, and i think um yeah it's a case of can can great britain can this country with with our multicultural diverse society um replicate what France are doing or even exceed what France are doing you know you know imagine if we had a Great Britain team and um, for the team team sprint that consisted of a rider that looked just like Gregory Bourget and was accompanied by a Chris Hoy and a Jason Kenny I mean mm -hmm. we'd um, we'd rule the world for the years if we had that kind of a, a talent I, mix together, I think, wouldn't we? I think that one thing that is important is a clear is a clear um is a clear way uh, uh, um what's the word I'm looking for um direction say for example a rider that is coming into the sport a young black rider how do they get from being a, a novice to how do they get to being a world champion and, yeah. and that there is a clear um a clear way that they know that okay so if you if you do this and you win this certain race that you will get to this position and that if you win this race you will get to this position you see mm. In, mm. i go back to to russell Remember, Russell had this. Russell, Russell was talking about this time when when he was told, it's a pity he didn't get it in writing. Actually, that he um, that if he won that if they won the actual um, mm -hmm. the national championship, that they would automatically qualify for the world championship, which is yeah. fair enough. But then mm -hmm. when the time came, um, nothing happened. You see, no. now, yeah, what I'm saying is there needs to be a clear. A clear path so that a ride so that a, a young person can say like like what bill does said to me that from here the first time i went to hern hill velodrome the very first time i was there sitting down in the Vibran stand we never rode the bikes that day we only had to listen and be told what was going on but from there i always remember him saying that from here you can go to the olympic games and now you sure. see that that is what you what i'm saying is is for young there's so much opportunities nowadays for young people in this country that what is going to make them want to be a cyclist? Why did why would they want to be a cyclist? What yeah. are they going to get from it? What is there? What's on the table? What's on offer? You see? Yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. I think I, it's I not think a matter of just it's fun. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, where are they going to go with this? Where can they go? What is what can they do? Can they That's can what, they can yeah. you know, can you say That's to them? Like, you know, I mean, I mean, I can say this, you know, I mean, it's no big deal in a way. Oh, but then when I turned professional and I rode my first six day, after okay. I rode that six day, I could go out and buy a brand new car, you see. <laughs> and you could that, that to me, at two years old, 
was mm. was quite an incentive, you see. And and well, you I mean, need, you know, what what can you what can you give these young people who are yeah. talented? What's going to make them want to go into cycling? Yeah, I see. You know, I think um, it's the lifestyle that um, of, of cycling that needs to be accepted. It's a tough sport. You've got to get out and do the miles. You've got to hurt. Um, I think um, you've, you've you've both given us food for thought with some of your reflections on your career. I'm going to wrap up now and, and say thank you um, to Morris Burton and to Charlotte Cole the same for sharing those reflections on their careers about the challenges that they faced in becoming British champions, about the barriers that they faced, about the, the, the mentors that supported them, and the uh, the, the club, the VCL. Um, the, the Valley Club of London and that fantastic community that's um, helped them along the way to become the champions that they are. So thank you very much uh, this evening for talking with us, Morris and Charlotte Cole, the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.